What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're back with another episode in the Emacs from Scratch series. Uh, this time we're going to talk about the different terminal and shell modes that exist in Emacs and how we can, I guess, learn how to use them and also configure them to be better than what they are as they come in the box because uh, as some of you might have seen as you've tried to use these modes in the past, uh, they can be a little bit mystifying at first, but uh, we're going to try to dispel some of that confusion right now and um, to try to get a nice terminal experience inside the editor. So uh, we are doing this live, and uh, I see some nice people joining the uh, the live chat right now. Hi, uh, Mayush, Alex, uh, P uh, Palak, uh, Ma Palak Mather, yes, Palak, uh, and Michael. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, so uh, Remy, welcome. Chavdar, welcome. So um, basically, I, Whenever you start to get into Emacs, I, I think that the natural conclusion to you know learning more about Emacs and learning more about its functionality is that you try to try to start doing more things in Emacs. And the reason why people do this is because um, once you realize how customizable Emacs is and how easy it is to set up key bindings and define your own workflow for things, uh, it makes more sense to try to do more of your tasks inside of this program. I'm not going to call it an editor because it's a program that has an editor, but it does so many more things that it's kind of like an, an insult to call it an editor, in my opinion. So um, one thing that a lot of people do if you're like a software engineer for work or if you like to work on coding projects uh, in your free time is that you need to have a terminal or a shell to be able to run commands for th doing things like compiling your code or uh, you know any other type of activity you would need a shell for. So um, Emacs does provide some functionality for being able to load a shell into uh, Emacs so that you can do those activities uh, using the same sort of comfortable situation that you're used to with, with, the, with the program. Um, so today we're going to talk about a few of the things that are built in, plus some external packages, or I guess one or two external packages that can help with the setup. Um, and uh, let's just go ahead and start jumping right into it. Okay, so uh, the first thing we want to talk about today is uh, term mode. Uh, term mode is a terminal emulator that is um, written in Emacs Lisp. Um, the nice thing about this is that it gives you the same flexibility and customizability that Emacs provides you. Uh, but the downside is since it's written in Emacs Lisp and Emacs Lisp is um, sort of like a interpreted slash bytecode compiled language, uh, it is slower than uh, maybe like a normal term terminal emulator you would be using uh, on your computer, like let's say GNOME Terminal or something like that. Um, however, uh, it is very convenient to have this built into Emacs because if you're on a Linux system or on a uh, Mac OS, uh, you, you can just use this straight out of the box. You don't need anything else to set up to use it. And before I go a little bit too much further, uh, I should explain what a terminal emulator is. So uh, in the old computer days before we had all these nice graphical interfaces, a terminal was basically like a, a computer that uh, communicated to a central computer somewhere or a, a monitoring keyboard setup that can uh, communicate with a remote computer setup somewhere. And uh, there were like very simple character based codes that would be sent back and forth between the two. So um, in a terminal, uh, like, like you have on a, on a modern computer is sort of emulating this environment where you have these control codes and text that get sent back and forth between the the client and the server. In this case, the client being the terminal emulator and the server being the you know the console application, the shell application. So a terminal emulator basically is emulating that interaction and it is interpreting these control codes that are coming from the program that's being run and using it to, to display things on the screen, uh, not only just the text that you see, but also the colors and, and uh, positioning of things on the screen, et cetera. So uh, a terminal emulator has to do more than just like read, read input, uh, sorry, read output and then send input to a program. It also has to interpret things and then display them correctly. So that's the reason why it's not so easy to have this sort of by default. Uh, it requires extra effort. And that's the reason why you have things built into Emacs like term mode. So um, we're going to go ahead and just take a look at what term mode does just out of the box. We're just going to try to run term mode with no configuration whatsoever. So if you were to run alt X uh, and then type in term, uh, it will ask you in the mini buffer uh, what terminal you want to run. And typically this is going to default to whatever uh, your um, shell environment variable is set to. 
So if I were to cancel this and use the get env command in Emacs, you can see me typing here in the mini buffer. If I type shell, then it tells me that the shell environment variable has this path to bash. So um, you can set this in your profile, uh, your user profile in Linux or, or in Mac OS, um, however you like. So if you like to use Z shell instead, you can set that there. But uh, since we are just gonna use the default, let's just run term. So now we can see that we do have a, you know, the bash shell here. You can, I mean, it seems like a normal default bash shell prompt. And you can do anything that you would normally wanna do, like, you know, looking at folders or, uh, let's say I wanted to run a command that's a little bit more complicated, like uh, htop. You can run htop and have some output there on the screen. So uh, it's actually able to display all this because it is in it, it is emulating this sort of terminal setup. Um, now, um, by default, it uh, it is pretty pretty usable. You can just use this on a day to day basis if you want to. But there's some extra things that you can do with the terminal functionality in Emacs. Uh, one thing is uh, you can try to navigate the prompts that you have, or you can uh, look at the command history, but those things don't actually work right out of the box. Um, there's some things that you need to do to set this up. So let me go and uh, grab this little snippet I have here for term, and we'll go drop it into our uh, Emacs from scratch configuration. And for those of you uh, who are new to the stream series, uh, you can go to my GitHub repo, um, uh, github.com slash davidwills slash uh, Emacs dash from dash scratch. And then you can see all the code that we work on here. And uh, whenever this episode is over, I'll go and commit the code that we work on today. So in the term mode section, I'm going to paste the snippet that I copied. And then we'll talk about what it does. So since term is a built in package, we can still use use package for it. It just doesn't try to install it because it's already built in. Uh, and we can use that just to sort of simplify and contain the configuration that we apply for it. So uh, uh, hi, uh, Kevin, David, uh, uh, Adol, Cherry, thanks so much for joining. Um, so the thing that is important right now, like we're not really configuring very much, but the thing that's important for just what we're do doing right at the moment is um, the term prompt regular expression variable here. So if you go look at the, um, the documentation for this, for some reason it doesn't want to come up automatically, but term prompt regexp. Um, it gives you a little bit of information about what this is for. The default value is this uh, uh, caret character. And what that does in the terminal is uh, it just looks for the beginning of the line. So if you know anything about reg regular expressions, the caret character just means beginning of the line. So if we try to use the the term prompt, let's see, is it a previous prompt? Yeah. Uh, term previous prompt, which is apparently bound to control K in, in this situation. Um, then it will try to jump to the previous prompt, but since it's jumping to the beginning of the previous line or just whatever line that it finds, uh, it's kind of uh, not very helpful. So what we need to do is go and set this uh, prompt regular expression. And if you saw before in the uh, uh, documentation for this variable, there is a sort of set of suggestions here for what you might want to use. And we can see that the suggestion for shell or just typical shell modes is this regular expression, which I've basically copied here. So I didn't come up with this myself. Uh, but basically, this regular expression is looking for any type of typical default bash prompt. So you, it will look for any kind of uh, sort of path before. And then it also will look for like a dollar sign at the end of the string and then a space. So if we were to evaluate this whole, well, let's, yeah, we can do that. Let's evaluate this whole config block. And I'll go back into my terminal. And in theory, this should start working correctly now. So if I were to use control J control, uh, let's see, control P. Okay, so it's not working now. Let's run term mode again. Yeah, so now it works if I get the selection out of here. So control C, control P is also another binding for it. And uh, anytime I use that, let's add some more some more uh, lines here. So if I use that, I can uh, use control C, control P to go back. It keeps uh, grabbing my selections for some reason. I think it's uh, evil mode doing that. Yeah, so you can use control C, control P, and I'll pull up the uh, global command log mode for this. So you can see it. So control C, control P for term previous prompt and control C, control N for next prompt. So if you had been typing commands in, like let's say LSAL, get status, uh, let's see, LS uh, dash R, that kind of stuff. Uh, now I can jump back into my history using the control uh, that one is, is breaking now. Maybe the, the regex is not uh, good enough for this particular set of prompts. If I were to go, let's see, right about here, maybe if I use the back and forward. Yeah, that it, it does break down in some cases because it is using a regular expression to find 
where it thinks the next prompt is. So your mileage may vary there. And also you need to know that if you are using a custom prompt syntax in your shell of choice, whether it's bash or Z shell, Z shell, et cetera, you're, you will have to configure this regular expression to match what you use in your prompt. Otherwise these commands will not work. The other thing that's uh, useful about this is that it uh, enables uh, history, I believe, in the prompt. I think this is coming from, uh, well, actually, this may be coming from Bash itself, but it does uh, enable history in other places, um, in other modes, like the shell mode, I think. So uh, let's see, what else do we want to say about that? So there is a, a very important distinction here also to be made about line mode versus care mode. Um, so in term mode, um, there, since it does terminal emulation, you do need some cases where you want all of your key presses to go through directly to the program that's being run in the terminal. Uh, sometimes you don't want that. You want to be able to use normal Emacs key bindings. So they have a split between line mode and care mode. And uh, I will turn off evil mode and I will describe why I'm doing that. But uh, let me do that first. So turn off evil mode. So uh, in a normal circumstance, I can type whatever I want into the terminal here, but then if I hit control C, it actually gives me the, uh, the, the control C prefix keys. Now, uh, if I switch it to uh, term care mode, instead, if I press control C, well, in this case, it's, it's still going to control C, but if I can press anything else, like let's say control X, you can see that it's doing this uh, term send raw. So instead of using the normal control X prefix in uh, Emacs, it's sending that on to the editor. So even anything else like um, normally escape, et cetera, would do that. But uh, since we're in care mode, let's let's actually do one little experiment here. We can run Vim inside of Emacs um, if I have it installed. And uh, since we're in care mode, we're able to you know do normal typing, hello system crafters, and uh, do anything that we would normally do in uh, in Vim. So I think that some things are not necessarily working exactly right, but uh, the idea is that uh, anything you type should be going directly through to the terminal. Yes, exactly. Uh, so let me see if I can get out of here. Because I'm supposed to be in care mode and it uh, normally would let me use the... Uh, oh, right. Okay, so some, sometimes escape doesn't go through. So you have to use other characters like uh, control uh, left square bracket to uh, mimic escape. So now um, that's why I what I was doing didn't work. So now I can use the colon Q command to get out of Vim, which is obviously the thing that we want to do here. So uh, now I'm, I'm back out of it again. But if I was to go into line mode, I wouldn't be able to do that because a lot of the keys that I'm pressing would go to Emacs instead. So since uh, if you have evil mode on and you're trying to, to use Vim inside of a terminal, which you normally wouldn't do, then if you press uh, colon, then it's going to go to evil mode instead of Vim. So you would need to switch to care mode to accomplish that. So anyway, this is a thing you should know is that uh, if you are using term mode and you're using some program that where the keys aren't working correctly, you may need to switch to care mode. Uh, the key bindings for this are uh, control C, control K, whoops, control C, control K, which gets you into care mode. And if you're using doom mode line, you can see this little lock icon down here that sort of indicates that you're in care mode. Then you can use control C, control J to go back to line mode. And you can see these uh, bindings. Uh, if I move my head a little bit, you can see it's term care mode, term line mode for control CK, control CJ. All right, let's see what else we got here. Um, all right, so now we've been using evil mode in the Emacs from scratch configuration. And uh, we've also been using something called the evil collection. And uh, the evil collection is nice because whenever you use certain modes, it automatically hooks up evil friendly key bindings for those modes. So uh, in this case, if I were to turn back on evil mode, turn on evil mode. Um, now, whenever I'm in normal mode, which is the mode where you would be able to do uh, keyboard motions in Vim style, et cetera, um, we are in line mode. However, when I in, uh, enter insert mode, which, when you press the letter I, it turns into care mode. So this gives you the ability to switch back and forth between line mode and care mode really easily because now you don't have to worry about using the control C, control K, et cetera, uh, key bindings. So it just happens automatically. Uh, but this, this can actually be a little bit annoying because now if I'm in care mode, I can't use uh, meta X, alt X to load my command palette or sorry, yeah, my command list. So I have to hit escape to get back to normal mode and then I can use alt X. So uh, if you are using evil mode and evil collection with term mode, this is something to keep in mind that uh, might provide you with a little bit of frustration at first, but once you sort of get used to the flow of using it, it will be easier to deal with. Uh, please at any time, if anyone has any questions about term mode or anything I'm talking about here, uh, please call out in the chat. Uh, and if also, if you're, if you're watching the recording afterwards, please just leave a comment and I'll be happy to answer your questions.
So, um, one last thing to mention about using evil mode with uh, term mode, or pretty much any shell that is a terminal emulator inside of Emacs, is that if you were typing something, let's type something that's actually real words. So like, if I were to type get status, um, and I went back to normal mode, and I typed uh, uh, like delete word or something like that, um, or let's say if I edited something here at this part of the line, if you go to the end and press enter back in insert mode, um, it, it doesn't actually take the edit that you made because the character mode is the place where um, the terminal is sort of accepting the characters you're typing. So if you go back into normal mode and start editing the buffer with evil mode, those characters don't get to the terminal. So the terminal thinks you type something else. So you need to be really careful if you want to use Vim style editing of your um, command line in evil mode, it won't actually send the, the thing that you're, you're typing. So let's try that one more time. I'm gonna type get status. I'm gonna go back to normal mode. I'm gonna delete this word with DW. And then I'm gonna type uh, blah. And if I press enter, it says get status blah is not a git command. And that's because uh, when we went back into normal mode and deleted that word status, uh, the care mode didn't realize that happened. So we're sending more words that uh, it, it wasn't expecting. So another thing just to keep keep in mind if you're using evil mode with term mode. Uh, so basically just uh, try to constrain your changing of the command line to the insert mode and care mode basically. Um, and then use your uh, normal mode for doing things like selecting stuff in the buffer, which is kind of nice. You can use, you know, the normal shift V and select things and copy them, etc. And also uh, you can do things like um, use the special bindings in evil mode for uh, the prompt functions, which could be the uh, the square brackets. If you hit uh, left square bracket twice, it will jump back to the previous prompt. And if you hit right square bracket twice, it will jump to the next prompt. So that's another little sort of uh, evil mode uh, performance boost. All right. So um, another thing we can talk about here is uh, how to make term mode a little bit more habitable if you're using programs that use a lot of colors uh, and maybe even use like a, the extended color range that some colors have for like 256 colors. Um, by default, we don't have that uh, capability built into term mode, but I can show you how to turn it on. Uh, uh, Jakob asks, uh, what is the difference between ANSI term and term mode? Are they the same? I will discuss that in, in just a moment. So um, what we're going to do is try to use this eTerm256 color package, which is on Melpa. And I'm going to copy it over to our config. And then um, let me pop that over a little bit. So now I'm going to install this with Control X, Control E. And uh, let me go and uh, I think maybe I could just run it here. So eTerm256 uh, e 256 color mode. So I'm gonna run it in the terminal we already have running. Um, but it tells me that I don't have the required term type e term color. Uh, do you want to fetch and compile it? I'm gonna say yes. And uh, what we're gonna see here is that there is an error and this may not happen on your system, uh, but it does happen on mine. So uh, there is a prerequisite to using e term 256 color, which is the tick command, T-I-C. And apparently this is a command that comes with the in curses application or package on your on your Linux distri distribution. Um, this is needed for compiling the color profile that gets used in eTerm 256 color. So since I don't have that installed, I can jump over to my own personal uh, console. Uh, let me just pull up vTerm here. And then I will install uh, Geeks install in curses. So in curses doesn't come on Geeks by default because it, Geeks doesn't really install any packages you didn't ask for typically. So um, I have to install that myself. But in, in most cases, you won't have to on Linux distributions because in curse is a pretty fundamental thing in um, uh, GNU systems. So it usually is there. So let me try to run this one more time. E-Term 256 color mode. Um, I'll run it again to enable it. I'll accept it. And now this time it finished. Uh, Actually, I should have shown this before. Uh, so let me use a couple of fun little programs to show you what it looks like before we turn on e, uh, eTerm256 color mode. So I will pull open this little snippet here and we are gonna use the, the legendary CalSay application and we're gonna run it through a program called lolcat that um, will make basically rainbow colors on whatever you pass through it in the pipeline. So I am echoing hello system crafters through CalSay and then through a program called lolcat. And we can see here that it doesn't really look right. I mean, it looks kind of cool, I guess, but it, it, something seems wrong about it. So if we turn on this uh, eTerm256 colors mode and uh, then run it again, 
then what we see is we get this nice little rainbow gradient on the colors and uh yeah so basically this package is able to hook into uh term mode and then provide you with the actual handling of all the uh, extended range of colors that you can get in a terminal so uh this is something that you probably should turn on by default because uh it will make your terminal life a lot better whenever you are using term mode all right so uh now we're going to talk about what uh, Jakob had asked about uh about ANSI term so ANSI term is a pack another package that's built into Emacs or it's another functionality built into Emacs um, and actually I think that it used to be separate from term mode but over time maybe even 10, 10 years ago uh, term mode and ANSI term sort of merged a little bit in the sense that now ANSI term sort of inherits some functionality from term mode and just you know makes it a little bit different so uh, the, ba the main difference that you can find is that whenever you run term again uh, it's just going to bring you back to your same terminal. So there's no, it doesn't automatically create a new terminal for you. So if you want to have multiple terminals open, then what you'll have to do is use this command uh, rename uniquely. So what this is going to do is going to rename your, your buffer by using like a numeric suffix to make it a unique name. So now we can see that this, this buffer is now called terminal two. And now I can run term again, and then it gives me a second buffer. So the difference here is that when you run ANSI term, it will manage having multiple buffers for you. And it's basically the same thing as uh, term mode. So I'll go ahead and kill, well, let's leave this one open and I'll run um, ANSI term. So it asked me what program to run. Um, and now if I, run ANSI uh, if I run ANSI term again, then it's gonna open up a second buffer. So I don't know, like it's not really like you you don't need ANSI term for this functionality. You could do the same thing with term mode. You could also write your own custom ELIST functions that um, that create a new term for you because there is the term function. If you were looking for the documentation for that using control H F, you, uh, you'll see that. Um, well, actually, no, I thought I thought it would let you say what new buffer you could create with that. Eshell does that, which I'll talk about in a bit. But um, you may have to rename the buffer after it gets created so that uh, you have a unique buffer, basically. So ANSI term does have a little bit of uh, functionality to that end. Another thing that's different is the prefix key that is built in is uh, not CC anymore, it's CX. So um, in in term mode, as we saw when we, when we were in care mode, we hit control C and it still popped open in the control C prefix. Uh, in ANSI term, if you are in care mode and you hit control C, oh, it does it also. So anyway, I read some information somewhere saying that was another difference between the two, but uh, I'm not actually seeing that myself. So your, your mileage may vary there. Uh, let's see what we say in the chat. Um, Monkey asks for, uh, can I talk about how to use the Emacs window manager? I am definitely going to talk about that in the next series of videos that I do. Um, uh, Jack asks if I could contrast it with VTerm. And uh, Brian also asked about VTerm. I'll be talking about VTerm next. So um, let's see. Is there anything else interesting about ANSI term to talk about? No, that's, that's pretty much it. So uh, let me say one thing about using term on Windows. The one thing I have to say is you can't. Uh, apparently, term mode and ANSI term mode both are hard-coded to the environment of, of a GNU system like Linux or you could you could say Mac OS too but just basically they they're looking for um, they're trying to launch applications in a certain way or launch your shell in a certain way and apparently that doesn't work on Windows um, some people have given you um, some there, there's some tips online you can use that might get you closer to being able to use it on Windows but I just don't think that it's gonna actually work for you so if you're on Windows, then your best bet is to use shell mode, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so uh, the same thing applies for VTerm. So VTerm is a is an external package that someone wrote, and it also is a term, terminal emulator. But the difference between VTerm and term mode and ANSI term mode is that VTerm uses a natively compiled library to do the terminal emulation. So since we said that term mode uses Emacs Lisp code to do terminal emulation, um, and that's slow because it's interpreted code or bytecode interpreted code, um, VTerm gets around this problem by using an actual native library that gets compiled on your system. And then that is what interfaces with the actual uh, shell that you're using so that it can read the control codes, inter interpret them a lot more fast or quickly. And then the sort of Emacs Lisp wrapper that takes care of uh, highlighting the text on the screen based on what you see. So um, let's take a look at the home page for that real fast, because there is some information there that you might want to follow if you uh, decide to use libvterm. 
Um, there basically is some configuration info and some, some suggestions. Uh, the most important thing um, if you're going to try to install vterm is to make sure you have the dependencies. So uh, first of all, you need Emacs compiled with module support. You need CMake. You also need libtool and uh, li they say libvterm is optional, but I found that it was necessary in my case. So uh, let's go ahead and try to install vterm. I'll copy this little snippet of configuration here and bring it over to our uh, config. And then I'll paste it in. So uh, we are going to install vterm. And uh, I'll go ahead and take that out since we have done that already. And the only thing we're really going to configure right now is the scroll back, which basically means how many lines of the terminal output are going to be retained in the buffer. Anything beyond 10,000 now will just be truncated as new things come into the buffer. You kind of want that. Um, like you need to have more buffer sometimes because if you have a lot of output that you need to look through, um, you, you'll want to keep some more lines configured. But if you have too many, then you start to affect the performance of Emacs. So it's good to kind of keep a good balance on that. So I'm going to try to install this now from Melpa. And then I'm going to try to run vterm. And now it says it vterm, if you see in the mini buffer, vterm needs vterm module to work. Compile it now. I'm going to say yes. Uh, vterm needs CMake to be compiled. Please install CMake. Well, uh, unfortunately, I did not install CMake before we sat down here. So let's see if I can do that quickly. So I'm going to do geeks install CMake. I'm also going to install libtools since I, need this, I know that's necessary. We'll see if both of those can be installed quickly. Um, let's see. So, uh, Gorov asked, can we keep appending the history lines to a file? I'm not sure that may be configurable for some of these, uh, uh, terminal emulators, but I haven't actually used it myself. So if anybody knows, uh, please let Gorov know in the chat. That'd be really helpful. And, um, uh, as far as like my own personal recommendation between vterm and term mode, if you can use vterm, I'd say it's better just because it is uh, much faster whenever you're dealing with, with large output, etc. Let's see. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to try to run vterm one more time. Compile it now. Yes. Uh, okay, so it tells me CMake is unable to find a build program. Okay, so it needs a C compiler. So let me just run this also. I apologize for the delay on this. Geeks install GCC tools chain. So you will you will need a compiler also whenever you try to uh, to build vterm. Let's see, uh, Glenn C. Jones says, with vterm, I found that set env uh, work to load in my settings like aliases, other suggestions on the web didn't seem to work for me. Interesting. Uh, yeah, vterm may not be setting some of the initial uh, environment variables that you need to get your bash profile to load correctly, but you also may, may need to set other um, uh, parameters to be used with your shell whenever it gets launched. And we can look in that in just one second. Let me see if I can get this to run again. vterm. So errors shell make command. Oh geez. Okay. So we got more more programs to install. So geeks install make. So that's part of the the joy of live streaming is that you get to see all the stupid mistakes that I make whenever uh, I am moving along here. So hopefully this is useful to you for from that perspective. What else? Um, Dylan says he's interested if the color is all right for you. Vterm always gives me weird colors, so purples look more red. Um, that is a, an interesting thing to report. I actually haven't had that problem, but maybe maybe it is an issue. All right, so one last, oh, it wants Pearl also. So, you know, I should take my own advice and read the, um, the requirements to see what things are needed before I start trying to build this. It's interesting though, that it did not tell me Pearl is needed. So that may be a uh, requirement of CMake or something related to that. So we'll, we'll try this one more time. And if it doesn't work, we may have to move on, uh, which would be unfortunate because vterm is pretty great. I also have it in my personal setup. So, all right. So we're going to show this in my own setup real quick. So I use vterm. In fact, I'm in it right now. Uh, you can see that I've been running all these commands in vterm. Um, the, uh, the, the typical things that you would expect, like the prompt functions. So let's say vterm prompt. Uh, previous prompt, next prompt, they're all there, like you would expect. Also, the Evo collection does have customizations for using vterm with evil mode, so you can do the same type of uh, bracket-based prompt movements as well. Um, now, vterm, uh, to detect your prompt, it also uses that same uh, term prompt uh, regexp. Since I don't have it set up on my machine, let me just do that really fast so I can demonstrate that it does work. So I'm going to uh, execute this line real quick. 
and then I will run vterm mode again just so that it maybe picks it up and then it doesn't seem to be picking up right now but I will kill this vterm and start a new one to see if it makes a difference then vterm one more time and then uh, we'll hit the enter key a few times. Yeah, so now it seems to be working. If I'm using the bracket keys, then it does jump back and forth between the different prompts. So that behavior is also um, maintained. Now, one thing you do want to keep in mind with this is that uh, if you have custom prompts, uh, you can do a different way of configuring the prompt detection. There is something called shell side configuration. Um, and there's a certain prompt string that you can print out with your prompt that will help uh, VTerm figure out where your prompt actually is. I believe it's in this section somewhere, but uh, if you want to have much better integration with VTerm with your shell of choice, uh, you should definitely check out the uh, snippets here and use those for your shell to uh, make, uh, to make uh, VTerm work better. So, um, Let's see, let's we'll just do a little comparison. Um, I will show you the output of that CalSay program that I had used before, if I can find my way back to it. So let's see right here. So in VTerm, if I do the same command, uh, I also get the colored output in much the same way, which is good, because it basically it already has this uh, capability built in. You don't need to do anything extra to get uh, the special colors. And also maybe if I go to a um, let's see, projects code, and then if I do ls uh, alr, then you can see that we get the output pretty fast. But in the term mode, let's see how much of a difference it makes in terms of how fast the output is. So let's also jump to that same folder, projects code, hack panel. Then I will say uh, ls alr again. Well, it seems faster, and but it is taking longer for the output to come out. So here's the, the, the core difference. I think that VTerm is doing some kind of buffering to get the output from the uh, the program faster and then just write it out in chunks to the uh, to the Emacs buffer so that it does not seem to take so long as it is right now. Uh, what you'll find is that whenever you run a console program, whatever terminal you're using can actually slow that program down based on how fast it's, it's able to handle the output. So VTerm will give you a lot faster handling of program output than uh, term mode will because it's written in C and, and it's compiled basically. Um, let's see, I think that's all we need to say for VTerm. Uh, it, like I said, in my opinion, VTerm is a pretty good choice if you're on Linux or Mac OS. It doesn't work on Windows because it makes a lot of assumptions about it being in a Unix style environment. So uh, it's another thing to keep in mind. All right, so let's talk about the uh, more Emacs native types of shells uh, or terminals. But this, we're really getting to like shells that are more of a part of Emacs itself. So um, we're going to look into shell mode first. And shell mode is a good middle ground between uh, terminal emulation and Emacs integration. So shell mode will run your actual shell program like bash or Z shell, et cetera. Uh, but it runs it in a way where Emacs is managing the, the IO um, uh, sort of more than it was before. So if we were to go into our config and run shell, then we get a shell and it looks, you know, basically like what we saw with term mode. But uh, a lot of things are uh, different. Uh, sometimes colors don't work by default whenever you uh, run programs. Um, if you run something like HTOP, uh, it doesn't work because, because we are in shell mode and shell mode is not a terminal emulator, it's just a shell. Um, programs that expect a terminal emulator will not work the way that you want them to. So that's one thing to keep in mind there. Um, there is a variable you can set that I use with eShell a lot. Um, let's see if I can find it real fast. It is the uh, eShell visual commands. And I think they may only work for eShell, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But it does allow you to run a command that would normally be needing a terminal emulator uh, from shell or eShell, and then it will run it in term mode instead, which can be helpful in some cases. So, uh, so shell mode is... Uh, the prompt is coming from your shell, but it's still being managed by uh, shell mode. I think that um, a lot of the things like, you know, jumping between prompts is, um, well, that may also be taken care of by term regex as well. So term prompt regex, I believe is being used here to manage the, uh, the prompt navigation. Uh, one difference though, is that since shell mode knows a little bit more about what's going on and it actually, it's the one that's taking the input from, from you when you're typing, uh, the, the evil editing of the command line does work. So in, in the past when we were typing git status, 
and we go here in normal mode and evil mode and delete the status, if we press enter, it actually does do the right thing. So a benefit of shell mode is that you can edit your command input in the way that you would normally edit with evil mode. You don't have to worry about this sort of weird split between evil mode, normal mode, and then the, uh, the input mode. And uh, also, you can do something with a council. You can get a uh, history of your shell command. So if I were to run council shell history, we will see that uh, we have a, a whole uh, history list of the commands that we've been typing in here. And in fact, it seems to be taking some things that I typed into vterm. So vterm may also be populating the shell history, which is pretty cool. In fact, let's go see, because uh, I'm curious to know whether that's a feature that I wasn't aware of for vterm. Actually, Hmm. Yeah, that's probably that's probably the case. Let's see. V term. Do I have one open already? V term. So we'll type uh, git remote v, and then I'll use the council uh, shell history. Yeah. So that didn't work here. So it must be coming from somewhere else. Maybe it's some things that had typed in here. Anyway, uh, shell mode uh, does let you see the history of the things you type. If I type git remote v here. Uh, and then I do the council shell history, then I can see that there, uh, which is very helpful because now you have a uh, fuzzy searchable history using council. So if I type make, you can just see anytime I've used make in a command, and then you can just put that command right back into your history. You can also use uh, alt P to go back in the history and alt N to go forward in the history. So you can just do that straight on the command line. I believe you can do that in bash too in general, but it's nice to have that in shell mode. Um, so uh, like we were seeing, there really isn't any coloring on the output except for some very basic coloring. Uh, there is a package you can use called uh, Xterm Color to help with this. Um, the configuration is a little bit different depending on whether you're using it with shell mode or with eShell. We may try to do it real quick just to see if it works, um, but I wanna make sure I have time to cover the rest of, my, uh, rest of my stuff. So maybe I'll skip that for now and then we'll go back to it a little bit. So uh, shell mode, is not necessarily the primary choice that you'd want to use if you're on Linux or Mac OS because you have better options for actual terminal emulators. On Windows though, it is basically your only option aside from eShell. So if you want to use an actual uh, shell program on Windows like command.exe, powershell.exe, or maybe the bash that comes with um, with Git or with msys, or if you want to you want to use the terminal from uh, uh, WSL, WSL or basically that, that environment, uh, shell mode is going to be the way that you're able to do that on Windows. And one little tip that I can give you for how to configure which shell, which does apply to the other uh, modes as well, is to use this explicit shell file name. So if you're on Windows and you want to use PowerShell inside of Emacs, what you can do is use this explicit shell file name variable to configure the name of the shell. So if you look at the, the documentation for that, it says, if not nil, it is the file name to use for explicitly in requested inferior shell. So uh, you can set that to powershell.exe or if using the, the more recent powershell core you can use like the pwsh.exe etc um, and then one thing you'll also want to do is to set this explicit powershell.exe args variable and make it an empty list because by default it's going to try to send some other argument to powershell that makes it have an error whenever you start up so you need to set this variable so this variable is actually kind of dynamic in that whatever you use for your shell file name, it's gonna look for a variable with explicit dash, whatever that that uh, explicit shell file name value is, and then args. So uh, anytime you configure any of your shells with explicit shell file name, which does work for term mode, et cetera, uh, if you change that, you're gonna to have to set a variable called explicit dash, let's say Z shell, Z, ZSH args, to, use, to set the arguments that get used whenever you uh, start that shell. So another little thing to keep in mind there. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically it. If you use um, PowerShell or command.exe, I think you do get some level of completions in a buffer um, or in the shell, basically like you know directories, et cetera. So it does have a little bit of niceties, but it's not like a full terminal environment and it may be subpar for what you need. So you may still have to use a normal terminal in Windows um, for, for this. Um, but that brings us to our next point, which is there is a shell that is actually native to Emacs and it works on all three platforms, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and it's consistent uh, and it provides you with a bash like experience and that is eShell. So uh, eShell is a fully uh, Emacs Lisp authored shell, which um, provides you with all the normal commands that you are used to like LS, RM, etc., to give you a bash like environment 
inside of Emacs. Um, but the, the difference is that uh, since these functions are all written in Emacs Lisp and since the shell is written in Emacs Lisp, there's a lot more customization and integration capabilities with, with Emacs itself. So uh, if you are sort of like really into Emacs and you're starting to get into Emacs Lisp customization, you may want to look into eShell because it gives you a little bit more flexibility on what you can do. So we are going to do, we're, let's just run eShell e to start with to see what it's like. So I'm going to run eShell. And uh, okay, it's pretty basic. You have a prompt. It looks a little bit different than the shell mode prompt because this is Emacs, Emacs sorry, eShell's own prompt. Uh, we can use LSAL. We get some colors on the output. Um, we can, let's see, run uh, RM uh, on some old file here. Uh, and all the same stuff will work on Windows. So it, you'll feel very at home if you're uh, used to a, a GNU style environment with Bash, et cetera, because uh, you'll have the same kind of functionality on Windows. Uh, the downside, though, is that since all of these functions and all these commands are written in Emacs Lisp, you do have to deal with the performance implications of having the behavior be written in Emacs Lisp. So whenever you're um, listing large folders or deleting large folders, sometimes it will take a while for the commands to complete because it's doing all this stuff in Emacs Lisp. Uh, I am very optimistic, though, that the new work that's being done to um, natively compile Emacs Lisp code at runtime in the GCC Emacs branch of Emacs that's currently going on right now. Uh, I think that that's going to help a whole lot for this. So eShell may be a bigger contender in the future if you want to have a fully Emacs uh, friendly shell. So uh, for me, at least, it doesn't cause me problems very often. So I, I live with it. I use eShell as my primary shell every day. So, it, you know, it really just depends on what you need. For me, it's fine. So let's uh, look at some of the extra stuff you can do for configuration. Well, since we are actually using our own shell now, one thing we might want to do is to customize a prompt. And a lot of times what you want from a prompt is to have information about the Git branch that you're on or just any other information about you know, your Git repo, etc. So there is a package we can install called um, eShell Git prompt. And I'm gonna copy this configuration bit over and throw it into our emacs.org. So let's uh, let's add another section for eShell. And then I will once again use use package for this because uh, eShell is already built in, but we're going to use use packages to to manage the configuration overall. And then I'll paste in some of this. Let me put this outside so it will uh, run separately. OK, so I'm going to install this eShell git prompt. And then I will, uh, I'm not going to run this configuration yet because I want to show you how this works. So in fact, let's go to the, uh, the homepage for this, the eShell git prompt. So there's a little bit of documentation here that might be useful to you. Uh, the most important thing is to explain how you can look at the different um, shell themes that are available. So you can use this uh, use theme command. So in our eShell, we can type use dash theme. And then we get this uh, listing, which actually gives us a preview of what our own prompt at this location would look like. So uh, we have the Robbie Russell. So if you've used eShell, I think this is like one of the defaults that are built in um, to the oh my ZSH uh, configuration package. There's also Git Radar, which I'm not as uh, familiar with. And then there's Powerline, which a lot of people like. This has been kind of a pretty popular uh, prompt customization that people have used in the past. So let's just say use theme Powerline. And now we automatically get this new nice looking prompt. Uh, we can, let's see, I don't want to switch to a branch here, but uh, maybe if I go to another project, let's see, get checkout B uh, test branch. So now we can see that we're in test branch on the console. I think they may do some other things as well. You'll just have to check the documentation, but uh, this sort of gives you a sense of how eShell does allow you to customize things uh, in the sense of Emacs rather than like some other system entirely, like what you would have to do with ZShell or Bash. So let's see, there are also some things you might want to configure to um, make your life easier in uh, eShell. So I'm going to copy a little bit of this config as well and explain what it does. So um, what you might hear from people who have used eShell in the past is that uh, it has some problems. And that's true. It does have some problems. And they're, they're mainly centered around um, eShell sort of working a little bit differently than other packages you might be used to in Emacs. So um, the way that you configure eShell is uh, a little bit harder because there's a lot of different hook points where 
to, to configure your shell as it starts up, you have to use some things that you're not really used to, or some hook points you're not really used to. So an example of that is this hook that I'm using here, eShell first time mode. Typically you would expect that uh, when you run, whenever you hook to eShell mode, that you, that would be all you would need to set configuration in the eShell mode buffer. But apparently that isn't what happens. Um, Sometimes you need to do things like the first time eShell is loaded. Sometimes you need to do things uh, before certain packages of uh, eShell are loaded. Um, you have to be a little bit careful about where you put certain configuration like variables or functions that you call whenever you're trying to set up Emacs or sorry eShell. So uh, if you have any trouble with eShell, please feel free to ask me. I've had to deal with this stuff a lot, so uh, I might be able to give you some tips. So either in the comments here or in the Discord or on the, um, uh, the, the issues of the Emacs from Scratch repo. So um, let's see, let me check in case something is going on here. Okay, so uh, let's see what we what we have here is, uh, first of all, uh, we are going to hook into the eShell pre command hook, which is uh, basically a hook that gets run right before any command gets run in eShell. And uh, we're going to run the eShell save some history command. So th the reason why I do this in my configuration is because uh, usually whenever uh, you are using eShell, it's building a history of all the commands that you're running, but they don't actually... Uh, they don't actually save those commands in your history until after you close eShell, which is a little bit weird because if Emacs ever crashes, uh, you'll lose your history of commands you've been typing in. So using this eShell e pre-command hook, uh, we will... Uh, save the history before every command that gets run so that we don't have a chance to lose it, which is a, a big uh, thing that will help you while you're using eShell. Thanks for letting me know that the stream is still live. I, YouTube's uh, analytics stuff is doing something weird here and says that I have zero concurrent views or viewers. So I was just trying to make sure that nothing bad happened. Okay, so also, uh, as I mentioned before, having a very long output buffer for a shell can hurt performance. So I'm adding this output filter function hook um, for eShell truncate buffer so that every time there's output to eShell, it will truncate the buffer past some per certain point. And that point is defined by the eShell buffer maximum lines. So we're basically just making sure that the buffer never goes beyond 10,000 lines. We're also setting the history size to 10,000, which means the history that you're, of the commands you're typing in will keep 10,000 of them. Also, we're setting this history uh, ignore dupes, which basically if you type in the same get status command 15 times, it will only put it there once instead of having it 15 times in a row, which is kind of nice. And then there is this scroll to bottom on input. So if you are in a buffer and there's currently some output happening, sometimes you want it to jump to the end of the buffer whenever the output's happening. Um, otherwise, the, the buffer may just stay in the same place and you have to scroll down manually. So this uh, scroll to bottom on input is actually pretty helpful for, for managing that. And for the evil mode users, uh, I do a couple of extra key binds here uh, for for e shell mode. One of them is Control R, since I'm used to Bash and other uh, shells that do Control R history. I set up Control R as a command for Council e shell history, and if we go back into e shell, we can see that uh, Council e shell history gives us the same thing. It basically gives us a history of all the commands we typed in so far. So. Um, the control R just makes it easier for you to get to that. Uh, also, one weird thing that I noticed whenever I was using uh, evil mode with eShell is that um, whenever I would hit the home key in insert mode, it wouldn't jump to the beginning of, the, of the, the command at the prompt. It would jump all the way to the beginning of the line before the prompt, which is really annoying. So this binding actually solves that problem. I, I can demonstrate the problem right now because I haven't run that uh, configuration yet. So if I type something and hit home, now I'm, I'm back at the beginning of the line, and thankfully at least eShell makes the prompt string read only, so I can't change it, but I have to like, you know, move my cursor back and manually place it again, which is really annoying. So uh, this uh, configuration here, if I were to run this little set of lines, then if I go back into eShell, I can hit home. Okay, so maybe I need to use uh, eShell mode again. I may have to restart eShell mode, but Let's, uh, let's kill this and start it one more time. Oh, you know what? It's probably because it needs to be run at the right time. It needs to be run in this first time mode. So this a good example of what I was talking about before. Let me just run all this configuration and we'll, we'll test it out. Okay. Let me just run it with eval region just in case. All right. So now I'm going to run eShell. And then if I type something and hit home, then it goes back to the beginning of the, the prompt string, which is much better. 
So um, I want to go into a lot more depth on eShell, but I don't have time to do it today. I'll probably make some separate videos because there are some other packages on Melpo that make uh, the eShell experience better. Um, one of them in particular, which I don't have time to cover right now, is completions. So a lot of times in Bash, whenever you type like get ST and hit uh, tab, it will tell you get status. And then if you type get checkout and then hit like start typing the name of a branch and hit tab, it will give you a completion for all the branch names that are available. Um, but that's not there by default in Emacs. Thankfully, there's a system called pcomplete built into Emacs uh, or in eShell that allows you to, to plug in your own completers. And in, apparently it's not very hard to make your own uh, Git command completion because a lot of people have done it. And there's some packages around that uh, work for this, though I weren't, wasn't able to get them work, working perfectly. There's also uh, a package that will take the completions from either bash mode or the fish shell and then bring them to each to each shell so that you can get basically the same completions you would normally get in fish shell or bash shell inside of each shell. So that could be helpful too, but it also has its own little uh, oddities here and there. So um, let's see, was there anything else I want to talk about as far as configuration is concerned? Um, yeah, I, let's, let's look at these, uh, these visual commands real quick, because I think that's a pretty important thing. So I'm going to go back to our config and I'm going to drop this in, uh, in our config section. So uh, what we're doing here is we're saying that uh, after the eShell opt module gets loaded or package gets loaded, and if you're wondering what eShell opt is, well, uh, eShell is comprised of a series of packages, and sometimes you have to hook your configuration after the load of a particular package so that it works correctly. So this is one of those oddities of configuration for eShell. Um, so we say uh, whenever we when we finish loading eShell opt, run these two lines, which is destroy buffer when process dies, and also eShell visual commands. If you look at the docs for eShell visual commands, it tells you that it is a list of commands that present their output in a visual fashion, and basically it means that it will run these in term mode instead of in eShell. So if I run this little bit, I don't know if it's going to work. I may have to um, uh, to restart eShell, but let's see what happens. So I'm going to run htop here. And then what we see is that it runs it in term mode. Um, so that is a lot better than trying to run it in eShell and then it not working it at all because eShell is not a terminal emulator. So, you know, if you have certain commands that you want to run that uh, may not work in eShell, you can do this. Um, SSH could be one of those as well because so, uh, SSH sometimes doesn't work very well in eShell. So you can use that as a visual command as well. It'll pop open into a term buffer instead. So that could be useful. So. Let's talk about the pros and cons of eShell, since it does have a lot more pros and cons than the other options that we've discussed so far. So um, the pros would be like it replicates a lot of bash commands with cross-platform ELIS functions, things that we can use on Windows just the same as we use on Linux, etc. Uh, and it, it gives you that consistent shell experience. You can, you can configure it one way. It works the same way on those different systems. Um, and also one thing that is cool is that you can run arbitrary Emacs commands and Emacs Lisp in the shell. So I can run an expression like, let's say 200 plus 50, and it will give me the answer 250. I can also run uh, particular commands, uh, like let's say uh, find file and then init.el. So we're actually running Emacs find file command just as you would run with uh, you know regular Elisp code or in the eval expression command. Um, you can also set aliases for these commands. And let's see if I, if I can do that right now without it breaking horribly. In fact, I can't really, I don't really trust myself to remember the right uh, syntax, but if you type alias and I think like FFO, then you can alias that to find file other, and maybe it's dollar one. So if I say FFO init.el, Okay, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. File other window. I believe it's called find file other. Let's see, window. Hmm. Find file other window. Yeah. So let's let's redo that again. Other window. This may not work, but we're gonna figure it out. Ffo init.el. Wrong number of arguments. Let's see what the. Maybe I have to use a uh, parenthesis or sorry, a quotation marks around it. Okay, so um, I think I'm using the wrong variable here, but the, the idea is that you can send an alias to an Emacs Lisp command uh, and then use that in your uh, in your shell, basically. So I do this sometimes for like basically this FFO command so I can 
open uh, a file that's currently in where, where I'm at uh, in the shell in another buffer next to this one that I'm currently in without having to do anything special, which is kind of uh, kind of great. You can also do things like DRED. Uh, you can jump right into DRED from here and navigate your file system a little bit more easily. We'll talk about that in the next episode. Um, so basically, any command that you want is here, and you can evaluate, you know, even more complex um, Lisp expression, uh, Emacs Lisp expressions. This is basically a REPL for Emacs Lisp. So if you're trying to figure out how to customize something or uh, some command that you need to run, you can try it out here in eShell and experiment all you like. So that's a, that's a kind of nice benefit. Another thing you can do is you can pipe output of commands directly into an Emacs buffer. Let's see if I remember the actual... Uh, uh, the actual syntax for this correctly. Um, I think it is the arrow bracket key, and then you say like uh, buffer test buffer. So now it's gone to a buffer called test buffer. I can switch to test buffer, and you can see that hello is here. So this can be useful for whenever you have a command that gives a lot of output, and you want to use some commands in Emacs like swiper, etc., for searching through all that stuff, or doing find and replace, or whatever you want to do. Uh, it can make it really easy to work with the out, uh, a large output from something and also process it and save it and all that kind of stuff. So that, that could be useful. And uh, another last uh, piece that we won't talk about today, but we will talk about at some point, is that it supports Tramp. And Tramp is basically a way to uh, remotely control another machine as if it's coming as if, as if it's your own machine so you're basically using like CD to CD into a remote folder and then you can run commands on the remote machine but you can also use your local Emacs configuration to uh, manipulate that, that remote machine it's very powerful and also it can be a little bit hard to set up so we're going to talk about that in a separate video now for the cons uh, completions are not great out of the box compared to bash as we mentioned uh, e shell commands can be slow compared to the real bash programs. Uh, piping is less functional than in real shells. Uh, you can't do a lot of the same things. Uh, subshell syntax is, uh, is different. So normally in bash, if you wanted to get the output of one variable or, pr or command, you would normally use like a uh, dollar with uh, open parenthesis syntax. But in e shell, it's actually dollar with open uh, curly braces. So that can be a little bit mystifying at times when you're trying to like copy some bash command someone gives you and you need to translate it over to eshell so be, be aware of that um, programs that read input can operate strangely so if you go into like the python interactive console or the node interactive console sometimes uh you you will end up in a state where eshell doesn't know whether it's supposed to control the input or if the the repl is supposed to control the input so be aware that sometimes you'll have trouble with that and you may need to use term mode for those instead uh, tools that depend on setting the shell environment don't work right, like NVM, virtual env, etc. Uh, there are sometimes separate packages you can install to help that with Emacs, but uh, it doesn't really work by default. And also, uh, eShell can be a little bit slow on Windows because there's more stuff going on under the covers that um, that might sort of get in the way of performance on, on Windows. But it's great that it's still an option that you can use there. Uh, so there's a couple of interesting articles you can read by uh, a guy named uh, Pierre Needhart who um, was a big proponent of eShell in the past and then recently decided to go back to using shell mode instead because of just some of the, the rough parts of, uh, of uh, eShell. So if you go to his website, ambravar.xyz, you can see the Emacs eShell article as well as the uh, eShell versus shell article, which sort of goes into some of the pros and cons. So that might be uh, an interesting thing for you to check out. So finally, my recommendations. Um, if you want to just use something that comes straight out of the box and you're on uh, on Linux or Mac OS, I would say Term and Ansi Term are your best bets because they're easy to set up. They don't really require much configuration and you'll get a pretty good experience out of the box. However, if you do a lot of work in the terminal that has a lot of output and you need better performance and you also need better sort of integration with uh, the... Uh, the interactive applications that you use in the console, then VTerm is a much better option and uh, it's being actively developed. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening there. In fact, it's gotten a lot better for me over the past six months than it, it was before. Um, then also Shell is a good option if you want to have a more sort of middle ground integration with the Shell and Emacs, but um, you uh, you still need to use like Bash or Z Shell, etc. And it's also great on Windows if you don't have any other option because, you know, that's... If you need to use PowerShell or Command.exe, then Shell is basically your option in Emacs on Windows. And then eShell on any OS, if you want a consistent Shell experience with the power of uh, Emacs Lisp and full Emacs integration. I use it all the time. I find it to be 
totally sufficient for what I need to do. Um, and I think that if there's any area that I would try to contribute code to in the Emacs code base over the next years or so, I'll probably do it in eShell because I feel like it has so much potential that really isn't being realized at the moment because of some of the warts that it has. So I don't know. I, I think that the more people who start using eShell and really investing time into it, building new packages for it, trying to help make contributions to the Emacs code base, the better it will get and the more that we can all really benefit from the, the potential that it has. So uh, definitely give it a try. Like, you know, if you are curious, definitely try it out and see if it works for you. Uh, ask me questions about it. I might be able to help you with certain things related to eShell. Um, let's, let's just see what we can do with it. So uh, that's all the content I had for today. Um, we did hit right about an hour, so that's good. Um, so in the next episode, which is gonna be the last episode for now in the Emacs from Scratch series, we are gonna talk about file management in Emacs. We're gonna talk about DeerEd, which is a built-in package. And we're also gonna talk about NeoTree. And if I find anything else cool between now and then, I might talk about that as well. But we're basically gonna see how you can ditch your file explorer program that you normally use and just do everything for file management inside of Emacs. There's some pretty cool tricks you can use. Um, and it's just, to me, it's a more uh, smooth interface than anything I've used before. So uh, you'll definitely wanna check that out. Um, so definitely subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification button to be notified before we go live. You'll get a notification in your feed about 30 minutes before we go live. Uh, Peter asked about Ranger. Uh, yeah, Ranger's great. There's also a Ranger.el for, uh, for Emacs. I might take a look at that as well. We'll see if I have time for that. And uh, also, lastly, I would like to thank my sponsors. So uh, since the last stream, we've had a, a lot more sponsors come online. I think we're up to 10 now, which is amazing. Uh, so uh, by sponsoring the channel, you're really sort of giving me the, the, the motivation to continue making this content because I really love doing it, but you know, it takes a lot of time. So uh, becoming a sponsor really helps to, to you know, continue this process going forward. Uh, I, I, I'm so thankful for all the people who joined since last week. Um, my, my current goal is to get to 15 sponsors. And what I think I'll do as a milestone for that is uh, I'm planning to do a video on the debug adapter, adapter protocol mode uh, at some point in the future. But if I get the 15 sponsors at some point soon, I'll do the, the DAP mode video like basically right after that happens. So that if you're interested in that video and you wanna see it happen sooner, then become a sponsor and it might happen sooner. So if you wanna learn more about uh, being a sponsor and sponsorship tiers, et cetera, go to github.com uh, slash sponsor slash David Will, and you'll see more information about that. I would appreciate anything that you're willing to do uh, there. Um, also, uh, we have a really great community building on the System Crafters Discord. If you look in the uh, the chat, there's a link and also in the, in the description of this video, um, there's about 65 people there now. We're talking about Emacs and Linux and, and configuration of window managers and stuff all the time. It's been really fun. I really appreciate all the people who have joined there. It's, it's been great. So if you're interested in joining a, a community of nice people who just want to talk about cool configuration stuff, please join the Discord and I think that we'll have a lot of fun there. So anyway, that was a lot of talking for me. Uh, hopefully that was useful for you. Um, so I hope that you all have a great weekend and we will see you maybe next week, maybe ne next Wednesday, maybe next Friday for the next stream. Uh, but until then, thanks a lot and happy hacking.